this morning. We're wrapping up our week, or rather our journey during the season of Lent that we've been in, the Red Letter Challenge. Today's day 40 of the Red Letter Challenge. If you've been doing the Devo with us, in fact, over 250 of you are doing this with us every day. And I want to say, if you're on day 40, way to go, you made it. If you're on day 30, way to go, you're still going. If you're on day 5, don't worry, you can still do it. I encourage you, in fact, if you haven't yet made it all the way through the 40 days of the Red Letter Challenge to keep going at it because we've been seeing that as it gets to come, when it comes to Jesus' word, we don't want to be foolish people. You know what foolish people are? People who just hear Jesus' word. That's what Jesus says. We want to be wise people. And wise people are those who actually hear his word and put it into practice, actually do it. We want to be wise, and that's what these last 40 days have been all about on the Red Letter Challenge, as we've talked about in our messages, shared in our small groups, and over 250 of you in your daily devotions. But as we talk about this week, we're going to talk about something that's kind of challenging for us when it comes to our faith, and it's our week of, of going. When I think of going, I mean, you kind of think about way, right away in the beginning, those who Jesus invited to, to follow him, those original disciples. I think especially of people like Peter and James and, and John. They were fishermen before Jesus called them. And his call to them was an interesting one. He said, follow me. And then he said this, and I will make you fishers of men. In other words, they weren't fishers of men yet. They didn't know how to do it. But Jesus said, come follow me, be with me, walk with me, watch what I do, do what I do. And I will make you fishers of men. Because when we bed with Jesus, it changes us, and it transforms us, and it sends us to go. You know, when Jesus called those disciples, I don't think they could have imagined how transformational his call would be, and how the first words they heard from Jesus would also resonate with the last words that he would speak to them. I know when you kind of look through history, people's last words are, are really important. I love what Martin Luther said while he was dying on his deathbed. He said this. He said, we are all beggars. This is true. He recognized that in the face of death. That there, but by the grace of God, go I. I need the grace of God. There, we are all beggars. This is true. Uh, like what Leonardo da Vinci said here, and I, and I wrote it down because this was really interesting when I found out his final words were these. He said... I have offended God and mankind because my work did not reach the quality it should have. That was Da Vinci. So I don't know if you're thinking about you. you yeah, I mean, that's, wow. Now, 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 John Wayne, I mean, everybody loves some John Wayne. The Duke's final words were words that he spoke to his wife. And he said this. I, I can't do the John Wayne voice. Anybody got a good John Wayne voice? And it goes like this. It's like, of course I know who you are. You're my girl. I love you. I mean, uh, that didn't sound like John Wayne at all. I don't know that John Wayne impression, but to tell me you were hearing John Wayne say that right out of the book, you know, that deep voice, yeah. Those were his final words, and, and, and this one, you guys remember President John Adams, his final words were this, Thomas Jefferson still lives. He was wrong. He died that morning, same day as Adams, July 4th, 1826. And Pancho Villa, anybody know Pancho's last words? They're really great. Here are his last words, honest to God. Don't let it end like this. Tell them I said something. <laughs> don't let it end like this. The person did it. They told them that he said something. I don't know if that's really what he wanted to be remembered by. Our last words are, are, can be pretty important. And so important are Jesus' last words. They're actually connected to his first words. And his last words are recorded by all the eyewitnesses. And they all have the same sense of going and sending. And the end of the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them all I command you. You get to the Gospel of Mark, and, and Jesus says, Go into all the world and preach the Gospel to all creation. In Luke 24, 47, he tells them about forgiveness of sins must be preached to all nations. And then he makes this other statement, You will be my witnesses. John 20, 21, as the Father has sent me, even though I am sending you. And Acts 1, verse 8, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and to the very end of the earth. Witnesses. Proclaiming what we've seen and what we've heard. And throughout the, the words that Jesus says, these last words, they're all these words of sending, of going, of continuing on his mission. And our temptation as Christians sometimes is to read those words and go, well, isn't that nice for those disciples? I'm so glad they did that because then I got to hear about Jesus. 
And we forget about that this call isn't just something that happened 11 or 200 or 2,000 years ago to 11 guys on a mountain. It's still the call today to all the followers of Jesus, to those disciples that you and I belong to be. It's what the challenge has been all about. Yet sometimes we forget about that we have this calling to share this message, this hope that we have. And I think sometimes the reason we forget is because we make it too complicated. We make it too hard. We come up with excuses for why we don't share our faith. We come up with excuses and we say, well, what if they ask me a question I don't know the answer to? What if, I, what, if I, what if I do it wrong? What if I say the wrong things? And so we, 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 we hold back. We don't share the hope that is within us. We think that we got to know more. we got to get more knowledge, and then, then we'll be ready to go. And certainly knowledge is helpful. It's good to know about Jesus. This 40-day challenge, I mean, the Red Letter Challenge has been not about me wearing all these red clothes, but about us being in the Word together and doing the words of Jesus. There's a value in there. But the one thing that we have to remind ourselves is that Jesus didn't just invite us into a relationship where we understand him perfectly. You will never understand God perfectly and completely. Because if you understood God perfectly and completely, what would that make you? God, right? You're not God. Turn to the person next to you and say, you're not God. <laughs> Some of you, that's the nicest thing you said to somebody today, right? Yeah. Right. But here's the thing, you're not God. But he does invite you. He invites you into a relationship. Or he invites you to trust him completely. Holy. To have confidence that he actually knows what he's, what he's doing. In fact, sometimes I know we want to know all the answers. We wish that we had all of the details and all the questions for whatever anybody might ask us. But sometimes the best answer that we can give to somebody when they ask us a question that we don't know the answer to is this. I don't know. Say that with me. I don't know. You've got to figure it out. You can say, I don't know. And I'm looking for you to have every answer, but when we don't know something, we want to dig deeper into the Word. And sometimes even when we dig deeper, we don't know all the answers and all the details. But what we do know, what we do know is what Christ has done for us, for our story, for our lives. And that what people need from us isn't something that we've made up or it's some kind of pat thing that we've got now, but rather what they need to know is our story and how it's connected to Jesus' story. On this Palm Sunday, that's exactly what we see happening the first Palm Sunday. I encourage you, you've got a Bible there in front of you or your outline, you want to pull it out as well. We're going to be in the Gospel of John. And when we go to the Gospel of John, we're introduced to the best supporting actor on Palm Sunday. Now, we know Jesus is the main actor. He's center stage riding on a donkey with, with people right. waving palm branches. Kids did a really good job and shouting Hosanna, which literally means save us. But one thing that we can sometimes forget is why people came to see Jesus. It wasn't because of somebody he healed. It wasn't because of somebody he fed. It wasn't because of something he said. It was instead as John, who was an eyewitness that Sunday, tells us, it was somebody who came back from the dead. Let's read it. John chapter 12, verse 17. The crowd that had been with Jesus when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to bear witness. The reason why the crowd went to make Jesus was that they had heard he had done this sign. The reason the crowd shows up on Palm Sunday is because in that Palm Sunday parade is a guy who had been dead and buried in a tomb for four days, and Jesus had raised him from the dead. So if you find out that there is a guy coming to your town who has raised the dead, and the formerly dead guy is with him in his parade, you're going to see it. You're going to go out and find out more information. Because no matter what we might be dealing with in our lives, we would all like to rise from the dead sometime. We would like to come back to life. And if there's a person who knows how to accomplish that, we're going to go see what he has to say. And it's not just that we want to be raised from the dead. In fact, if you think about it very long more, what is what, what bigger in your life? If he can raise somebody from the dead, he can raise your career from the dead. If he can raise a body from the dead, he can raise your, your marriage from the dead. If he can raise the dead, he can raise your broken relationship from the dead. Is there anything that he cannot do if he can, rot, if he can raise the dead? You show up. You come. Because you realize he is who everybody has been saying he is. 
And it was just because of a resurrection that brought this about. Now, now the story of Lazarus, it, actually, it happens in John chapter 11, a couple pages earlier. And in a couple pages earlier, what we find out is that when Jesus found out that Lazarus was sick, it started just with his sickness. And they sent word to Jesus that Lazarus was sick because Lazarus is a friend of Jesus. And, and who better to be friends with than the Savior of the world who has power to heal people? But yet Jesus chooses to not heal Lazarus. He knows Lazarus is sick. He knows he needs help. But Jesus doesn't intervene. In fact, he waits so long that Lazarus dies from this illness. And he doesn't even show up for the funeral. And it's four days later when Jesus finally gets there. To the town of Bethany, a suburb outside of Jerusalem. And when Jesus gets to Bethany, he talks to Mary and Martha, who are Lazarus' sisters, and he says beautiful words like, I'm the resurrection and the life, whoever believes in me, even though he die, yet shall he live. It's great comforting words of hope. But then Jesus goes to the tomb of Lazarus. And as he comes to the tomb, John tells us because he was there, he does something incredible. John chapter 11, verse 35. Jesus Wept. Now, besides being the shortest verse in the Bible that all my confirmation kids who are getting ready for confirmation in two weeks want to pick as their Bible verse because they can memorize it, it's good, that's fine. <laughs> but it's better than that. I mean, isn't it comforting to know that your God in the flesh cried? That he wept when he saw people hurting? Especially that they heard of death. It, 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 and he knew what he was going to do. Right? I mean, it's just moments away. He's going to raise Lazarus from the dead. He knew that was coming. He knew a resurrection was coming. But in the moment, he cried tears. I hope that's comforting for you. If today, tears are close to the surface. Your Savior knows your pain. He knows your hurt. He knows your brokenness. And he weeps over it. And he can do something about it. As Jesus continues, he tells the people who are there at the tomb that he wants them to take away the stone that had been rolled in front of Lazarus' tomb. And one of the sisters, she speaks up and she goes to Jesus and she tells him, this is great, the King James Version, I love what it says. It says, Lord, he's been dead four days. He stinketh. She understands that the dead people, the, the, the bodies decompose, it smells, death is nasty, it's a smelly business. And she doesn't want the tomb open, but yet, nevertheless, they open the tomb, and then Jesus does something even more incredible. He says a prayer. And the prayer he prays, it, it, there's, it, there's no request, there's no plea, there's no crying out in a loud voice, and said, Jesus prays this. Father, I thank you that you've heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around, that they may believe that you sent me. In other words, he already prayed quietly. He already knew what Jesus was going to do. He already knew Lazarus was coming back to life. But what he wanted to was to make sure that they understood why Lazarus was coming back to life. That it's about God, the Father, who has sent Jesus. And that they might know that. And so Jesus then says in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out! And lo and behold, Lazarus comes out of the tomb. And you can imagine the whole crowd that's there around them who previously had been crying tears of sadness and pain and hurt. Now there's tears of joy and wonderment and, and amazement. What has happened here? We've seen a dead guy. We went to his funeral. We've been comforting his sisters, Mary and Martha. And now he's walked out of the tomb alive. And he's still wrapped around in his, in his garments, in his grave cloths. We don't know if he stinketh, but we do know that he's got the grave look on him. So much so that, that Jesus has to tell the crowd, you know, somebody get him some clothes. Get those off him. He doesn't need it anymore. He's not a dead guy. He's a live, living man back from the dead. And because of this, John 11 tells us this. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what Jesus did, believed in him. Do you think? I mean, isn't that obvious, right? Jesus just raised a dead guy. I'm going with him. He does incredible things. I don't know anybody else who can raise the dead. This is decision time, isn't it? I mean, because either he's a lunatic and a crazy guy, or he's the guy who he says he is, God in the flesh. This is decision time. No more fence sitting about who Jesus is in a resurrection from the dead. You've got to decide. 
And for some, they believed in him, but some of them went to the Pharisees, and they told on Jesus tattletales, and they told the chief priests and the Pharisees, and gathered the council together, and they said, what are we to do? For this man performs many signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him. You think? I mean, these guys are geniuses. They get it. Because a resurrection changes everything. I mean, changing water into wine, a neat party trick, right? I mean, bread, uh, five loaves of bread, two fish feeding 5,000. Well, maybe they were just making that, making that up. Uh, healing the blind, maybe the guy was joking about being blind for the last 45 years of his life. But a dead guy? A dead guy buried in a tomb, coming back to life? People are going to believe in Jesus. And for the leaders of the day, this is a problem. Because if they believe in Jesus... That means they're going to lose their power. They're going to lose their position. They're going to lose their control. Because everybody's going to believe in Jesus, and they just might believe in Jesus too. This might be a career changer for them if they let Jesus go on for this. Because there's no more fencing. Either he is God in the flesh here on earth, or he's not. And the time has come to decide. Back to Lazarus. See, what I was telling you about Lazarus is, is that Lazarus, we don't have any words that he recorded in Scripture. We don't know what Lazarus ever said. His story, though, his story is transformation. Because back to that John chapter 12, we heard it and read it in the beginning of our service, that when Jesus is with Lazarus and they're going in and their palms are being cut and laid on the road and people are shouting Hosanna, Jesus is there, but Lazarus is with them. And those same leaders who realize that everybody's following Jesus and something has to be done about Jesus also say this about Lazarus. John 12, 10. So the chief priests made plans to put Lazarus to death as well. Because on account of him, many of the Jews were going away and believing in Jesus. He needs to die. Because every time somebody sees Lazarus, all they think about is Jesus. Can you think of a greater way to be described than to be counted worthy to be always identified with Jesus? For the leaders of the day, that meant a threat. But for the people in your life, it can mean life. That's something to be known for. We don't know what Lazarus ever said, but we do know the story of how his story of his life connected to the story of Jesus transformed other people's lives as well. And if you think about it for a little bit, just bringing people to Jesus, you're bringing dead people, dead people back to life. You are. Romans 3.23 declares that the wages, that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and that sin has a problem. In Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is, is death. That's bad. We don't want that. We don't want that for, for people in our lives. We don't want that for our children. We don't want that for our spouse. We don't want that for our friends. We don't want that for our coworkers. There are people all around us who have a death sentence around their neck, and some of them don't even realize it. In fact, many of them don't. I've showed you those stats over and over again. Two out of every three people you come in contact with every day don't know Jesus as their rescuer and their savior. And they're carrying a death sentence around them. And I know too often as Christians, we simply look at their lives and say, well, they're good. It doesn't seem to be anything wrong with, with their life. They're a good person. It doesn't matter. Good person. Good persons are carrying death sentences upon themselves. Because all sin leads to death. But the good news is, as Romans 6.23 declares, that we don't have to end in a death sentence. The free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. A death sentence is what we deserve, but a gift has been given to us in the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus for the forgiveness of our sins so that what separated us from God might be removed so that death is not so that death can be defeated and eternal life can be given. And we get to be those people. 
We get to be those people who share that story with those around us. With the people that God has perfectly positioned in your life today to speak up when those opportunities pop up. It's time for us to let aside those excuses and the reasons that we don't share instead and realize with joy the privilege we have to bring words of life. And sometimes that word's just simply done through sharing our story. Because our story is connected to Christ's story. And when we share that story, we're reminded that what we're doing is we're releasing a burden of death and sin, bringing a gift of life by the power of the Spirit. I love how Pastor Zach, in our 40-day in our challenge, one of the verses this past week was from Revelation chapter 12. And I love that verse from Revelation 12, verse 11. I hadn't heard it in a long time, but, but the way that it's written is it talks about this, this scene in, in heaven and eternity. And it's a scene that tells us how people, you know, arrive there. And he tells us this. He says, they have conquered him, that is Satan, with the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. That the victory, being in that eternal life in the presence of Jesus, that we're there only by the blood of the Lamb. It is only by what Christ Jesus has done. It's what this week is all about. Reminding ourselves our faith is a done faith by Jesus Christ alone. But we recognize that that message of that faith is carried out by you and by me, by the word of their testimony. By the word of the testimony that was shared with you, perhaps by a parent, perhaps by a loving and caring adult, perhaps by maybe a Sunday school teacher or a neighbor who invested in you and helped release that death sentence that you had and instead exchange it for a life sentence with Christ forever. And all that it takes sometimes is to recognize that, that your story, your story, is connected to his story. Our story is Adam and Eve's story. We were hiding in the garden, making excuses for our sin, unable to cover up our shame. Our story is Jonah's story. We were running from God, denying our calling, surrounded by a raging sea. Our story is a prodigal son story. We were wasting our blessings, lost in our failures, too afraid to return home. Our story is Peter's story. We were unbelieving, full of fear and doubt, our faith slowly sinking beneath the waves. But that is not the end of our story. We are all longing to be restored. We want to stop running. We want to be found. We want to believe, and we are crying out for a Savior. So God stepped in into a broken world, into human form, into our very lives. God stepped into our mess, into our sin, into our failure, our fear, our doubt. He stepped into death. And the door shut behind him. story of life. It's a story of resurrection. It's a story of hope. And my prayer is that this week, this week, yes, this week, maybe even today, 
in a time where we're culturally, where, where we're thinking about, we're talking about Easter. Maybe that this is the week that you have that investment in somebody else and you actually take the courage to speak up of the hope that you have and the promise that you have in Christ Jesus. My prayer is that you're able to, to take that next step, to ask some questions, to go beyond just ignoring somebody in their life, but rather to invest in that life and to recognize that their story can be connected to Christ's story too. And that you just might be the person whose testimony, blood of the Lamb, is going to use this week. Maybe you invite them over for coffee. Maybe you have some lunch together. Maybe it's just a conversation. Maybe, maybe you take a risk and you, you invite them to, to, to worship on Thursday and see the drama carried out of the Living Last Supper or the, or the, or the brutality and the, and, the, and, the, and the solemnness of a good Friday or the joy of Easter. In fact, we made it easy for you in your bulletin there. You can just use that whole half page and, and just give it to someone, English or Spanish. What will you do this week? You've been saved by the blood of the Lamb. That has been done for you, completely paid in full. But the word of your testimony is needed to the people around you. So let's have the courage to speak up. Let's look for the opportunities to pop up, to invite somebody else into the story that God has invited you into by his grace and through his mercy. Let me pray for us. Father, we pray that this holy week, even this very day, this Palm Sunday, that as we think of those who cried out, Hosanna, save us, that we recognize around us in this world there are many people who aren't crying out, save us, who don't even realize they need to be saved, who think life is just simply about getting by and being good. But Lord, you've showed us during this Red Letter Challenge that this life is so much more, so much more than just simply getting by, so much more than just hearing your words, but putting those words into practice. And seeing the transformation that those words can have by the power of your Holy Spirit in our lives and the lives around us. So Lord, I pray that you would imprint on us that person this week who you would invite us to, in pop, to, to speak up of the hope we have. To share our story with and to tell your story as well. Lord, give us the courage to do it and give us the strength to do it because we can't do it on our own. May the excuses go by the wayside and may your word instead come to the forefront, rise to the surface, so that it too can bring that life-changing word to one other person this week. And that it might just be our word, our testimony, that you use to change an eternity. To use us, Father. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand.